Alrighty, everybody, welcome to, I don't know how to call this, it's kind of a different, it, it, yeah, the best way I can describe it is, I'm actually very excited to, to do this video, I've been wanting to do it for the longest time possible, and we have a very, very special guest with us. I'll figure out her name, I'll put it in the intro, till that happens, we have Dylan from uh, Games Layer joining us today. Is it Game Gamer's Layer? Gamer's Layer, hey, Gamer. Gamer Layer? Gamer's Lair. It's backwards here, but you get the idea. I get the idea. Uh, well, <laughs> I should probably click you in right now. There we go. We're clicked in. <laughs> Anyways, so you should be able to see Dylan. Uh, in oh, right now. was I not on the camera? Okay. I, I was basically looking at an exception of myself for the, for the longest time until I'm like, wait a minute, I should probably click Dylan in on this. But for now, we'll open up the uh, usual Nova Man Juice. And... Before I kill myself. <coughs> yeah, so I've been actually very excited to be doing this video, mostly because there's been a lot of recent news in Forza World community and... A lot. A lot. And at a local game shop here, we don't have the connections that some of the bigger stores do. And we don't have the player base. And because of that, we're actually... Our player base is the one promoting the game. Our player base is the one that's trying to generate more interest in the game and you're trying to generate more people. The, the shop is basically just like, we're providing the, the space, but aside from that. So we wanted to get, regarding all the news and everything, I wanted to get an idea from one of the bigger players in the Canadian community, which I see as Gamers Lair. And you're, gonna, you're nodding your head, but <laughs> it's true. You are one of the bigger ones in the forceable community for Canada. Well, it, it's funny that people say that because I feel like there's this big conception where it's like, oh, this store is bigger. We're just a small time thing. It's whatever. And I hear this all in the States, too. But the reality is um, forceable, even though it's up there, it's not like a, a huge game. Right. So a big community is like 12 people. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like uh, if you got a lot of people in the local area, and, and we're pretty fortunate because we're near Toronto, we do have a lot of people who come in for events and stuff, but our local community is like eight people. <laughs> you like know what? frequently recur and show up, and that's a lot of people for Force of Will, just that is how a, the game works. Exactly. exactly. That, that is, is a lot of people, people for Force of Will, like, like eight, eight people, people recurring. recurring. For, for us, us, when we were consistently going, going, we would maybe have, have the most we've ever had was probably like 10 people with grabbing a few new faces. And unfortunately, with stuff going on between myself, um, a couple, a couple of the people, people working nights, and as, as you, if a, a lot, lot of our core group, especially in our, our channel, channel Master Fija and Dayman, all work out of town. So because of that, that you kind of lose the core of the players, players. And, it and it makes it a little, little bit harder in order, in order to try to grab more players. Like you show up at the shop, but if there's only two or three people playing, it's it's difficult. Yeah, it's 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 different than having a recurring tournament, right? Um, exactly. And that's the thing and that I makes it hardest is getting the core group of four people, which is the minimum you need to run a tournament. Just getting them to show up, recurring, so people don't go, "Oh, should I go? Is there going to be people there?" All that kind of stuff. You don't want them thinking that. You want to say, "Hey, there's definitely a tournament on Friday or Thursday or Saturday or whenever, and I want to go. Can I make it this week?" And as long as you got enough people saying yes, I can, then you got a, a community, right? That's all you need. I, I agree, and you know what? Willing to show up. That'd, be That'd be something to point out to our, to our, to our shop. Four, Four people can classify as a tournament. tournament. Yeah, even if you do it once a month. month. It's, that's it's, how it's, I run every game. Really? Okay. 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 Well, that's, that's, that's you know what? If you can get four people, that that should be enough for a tournament. And I and encourage any store owner to look at it that way. As long as you can run a tournament, it, it should be a tournament. And four is round robin, but it still works. Like it doesn't have any. It's any round problem. robin. It is. You know what? As long as the players enjoy the time and enjoy playing, like playing the game, that's what that matters. Like. I drew, I drew my, my son used to love playing Pokemon. Pokemon. He's, he's, he's about 12 now. And, and when, when I, I when I brought home Force of Well, because I wanted to get into it, when I brought home Force of Well, I'm like, hey, I got a new game for us to try out. It's, like, it's sort of like Pokemon. I kind of explained the game to him. And he jumped on board right away. And then I find kids actually get into it really easily. Yeah, that's one of the things I've really figured out. And then over the weekend, he had a friend over and it was kind of a... I, I unfortunately have, as you guys can see behind me, I have all my cards kind of like spread out. So on a, on our, on our game table down here in the basement. So his friend kind of came over, looked over and was like, what, oh, what is this? My, my son started telling him about it. I was like, oh, you know what? I actually, this looks interesting. Can I come with you guys the next time you go to the shop? I'm like, absolutely. Bring more friends. <laughs> so, yeah. So, ah. Uh, Okay, so, okay, so I'm going to start, start going, going off, off questions, questions here. They're not sure. necessarily in order, but it's, it's kind, kind of, of a more of a perspective, perspective from, from, I want to say a Canadian, Canadian player, because you, you're, you're the one that's, that's 
I mean, I, I'd like to just kind of say that it's mostly the same everywhere. Yeah. Um, it's like Forza was a really big game. I'll put that out there. It's not like it's a really small game. Like a good example of a small game would be like Final Fantasy. Uh, it's pretty heated fan base, but I'd say a big Final Fantasy community is like four people, six people who actually show up recurring, right? Okay. Whereas I'd say a big Forza will is like 12 to 10. And it, that doesn't seem like a huge difference, but... When you're barely scraping four people and that's considered like a good tournament showing for that kind of game, I think that speaks a lot. Whereas I'd say it's pretty recurring and, and expected that a good force of will tournament is 10 plus people, uh, eight plus people, depending where you are. Okay. okay. Um, and I, I think that says a lot. It, it does, does say, say a lot. lot to be a friend. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, we have, we have a surprise, surprise guest joining us here. here. Um, um, yeah, yeah, sorry. sorry. So, so Dylan, Dylan actually, actually does, does not have, have a video, video signal on my on his side. I have audio. So he's all blind. His audio is all blind. So uh, the, uh, the best way I can describe it is like a hundred pound over man, just coming to say. Oh, okay. I was thinking cat. So it's a little different than what I was thinking. I was thinking cat or child. So no. Yeah, no. I mean, I agree with you, especially if you join because you're definitely part of the. The Force, Force of Will US, US group, and, and there's, there's a lot, lot of people on there that enjoy the game. game. There's, there's a few trolls, but the majority of the community is extremely positive. Um, having a lot of new people on the group, like just lots of new people asking, hey, where's the nearest locals? Can we start a locals? How do we start a locals? I could not if you've got lots of people saying that, then that's obviously a good sign for the game, right? I could, I could not, not agree more. more. When, when we started, started like, like when we were, unfortunately, unfortunately haven't been able to make a few videos for the past couple of weeks here, but when we were making consistent videos, a lot, a lot of our, our new, new viewers, viewers were actually new players that just, just want to start to play in the game. game. And, and um, because, because I, of my Italian background, background I, started, I actually, actually joined the Italian Forcible community group and started, started talking to people on there as well. well. And, and it's, it's insane, insane the amount of people and how, and how big, big the game is in Italy. Italy. Like, like the, the next, next time, time I go to Italy, Italy oh my gosh, gosh this has, has to be like one of the things I need to do is just join, like I, uh, time to run a tournament. <laughs> People don't really get it, but the reason it's so big there is because the distributor, like the supplier for all the stores is the one actually organizing everything. So they have a really big interest in making sure it actually is succeeded and supported and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and yeah. they do everything out of pocket. Really? really? Wow. Yeah. So that's why their tournaments are always paid regardless of what the tournament or well, more or less paid now. It's still a little bit of a company. But you know what? what? Like, like we've, we've had this, this we've had this round before, but I mean, as a distributor, that's, that's the best, best way for you to market your game. It doesn't matter. Yeah, if you're, absolutely. It's just a different view of how distribution works in uh, Europe versus here. Here, it's strictly supply and demand. I sell you things yeah. as a business and as a business, I buy things. And that's how it works. Right. Um, a lot of the time I know more about the game than the distributor does. Which, which is, is, you know what, what which is, is kind of unfortunate. unfortunate. I mean, we're, we're getting, getting sidetracked, sidetracked here, but, but it, it is, is very <laughs> unfortunate <laughs> simply because of the fact that, that w the, the, okay, okay, the, the best, best way I can describe it is in Italy, they have the proper, proper mindset for how to do business, which is what they used to do here in North America. For some reason or another, it has turned, as you have said, it has turned 100% into supply and demand, which is unfortunate because like... I mean, the, the thing, thing for running a successful, a successful business, business is you need to spend about 80% of your gross profit, gross profit on marketing itself. And, and I have, I have a huge round of regarding that, but that's, that's it. It. anyways, going oh, well, back without to getting <laughs> too into it and getting too distracted. I think the, a lot of the issue is that uh, the distributors in North America are a lot smaller and yeah. uh, they have a lot of time where they invest in something and they get burned. So they just keep a hands off approach. They know magic Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, those sell. Uh, they don't know too much about them unless the sales rep knows a huge amount because they play. Yeah. Uh, and if they don't, then it's usually they're like sports cards or something. And that's but, that's it. They, they can't get invested because they've done it too many times and they get burned. So they leave it to the stores. And the stores, unfortunately, unlike uh, the ecosystem they have in Italy, yep. they just got to kind of do themselves, right? Okay. okay. All, right. All right. Fair, Fair enough. enough. So you just got to stick together as a store. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll keep my rents over. <laughs> For sure. Okay. So. Uh, uh, tell, tell us a, us a little, little bit about yourself, how you got, got into, into the game, game. what actually drew you into the Forcible game. game. Uh, was, uh, was it a specific card? Was it the community? I, I know I kind of you're, you're, you're kind of like, like the manager of, a, of game, game, Gamer's Lair, but, but mm -hmm. gonna, give, give us a little, us a little bit of background on what, what, what drew you and what, what, what gets, gets you excited, excited about the game. Well, believe it or not, I didn't really used to be super into card games, despite where I am now. I did play a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh, but it's mostly just because I had a lot of friends who played it, and it's what I grew up playing. So when I got back into playing cards, it's it's the game that I naturally drew to. But at the my current business partner and the one who used to run the old Gamer Slayer actually just mentioned that there was this new game coming out 
and it had really amazing artwork. And that's something that I always hear about Force School is that people love the artwork. And it's the one thing that always sticks with people, regardless of what they think about the game. So I was like, okay, that sounds kind of cool. And then uh, in one of his last few weeks of running that store, he actually got the starter decks in. So we all bought them and we started playing and we're like, hmm, this is this is actually really good. Like, I really like these mechanics a lot. And I've seen people play Magic and I've seen people play games like that. But the biggest thing is that the stones being outside of the deck, man, you don't have these really bad, breakable hands. And if you ever played Yu-Gi-Oh!, you know that you always have really bad hands. They just kind of have to work through and hope they don't hose you over. But I found that in Force of Will, you don't really have that problem. The starter decks kind of laid that out. And for anyone who doesn't remember, uh, the starter decks when Force of Will came out in North America were from Valhalla Cluster and okay. not like this Valhalla cluster. There was another Valhalla cluster, and it's very, very different than what we actually ended up getting in Force of Will in the Grim cluster. Um, so we got those starter decks, and then we found out that those starter decks are pretty outdated, and there was a new uh, bunch of sets coming up based on like fairy tales. We're like, oh, that's amazing. So we, me and uh, about six other people, we ordered this huge case of stuff from the States because uh, the U.S. got it poor Canada about two months in advance. Okay. So we got like five boxes of Tad and like two boxes of uh, Moon Princess Returns, like two boxes of uh, shoot Crimson Moon Fairy Tale. Yeah. And uh, that's that's basically been it. It's never been like any one thing. Force of Will just has constant, consistent gameplay, um, has really good artwork. It's got a uh, fluid uh, deck construction and uh, basically everything about the game is just uh, solid. Very it's, solid. It's, it's, it's really, really fun. fun. The, the thing, thing that I've, I've noticed, noticed, like, like mind you, I've only been playing, playing since... since um, since the new Dawn, Dawn Rises. Rises. What, what I've really, really noticed, noticed is that, that if there's, there's a broken, broken card, card, they'll fix it right away, away which is surprising because, because a lot of people in the community complain that the company, the company doesn't, doesn't really communicate, doesn't, 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 but at the same, same time, time, they fix it right away, away and they're like, like here, here it is. is. Here's, Here's what's going on, here are the changes. I know, hit and miss. I agree, hit and miss. Even when it's miss, I feel like that it's a lot less impactful than it is in other games. I think a lot of what we've seen recently with NDR going forward was Jeff Finnegan, our yeah. previous liaison, having a really big hand in that stuff. But honestly, even when the formats were like bad, bad, it wasn't like Yu-Gi-Oh! Dragon Rulers or Magic where you have the Eldrazi and you can't do anything about it. It's like, well, it was unbalanced, but it was the point where the game was still playable and good versus just jumping ship, right? I could, I could not, not agree more, more. Especially, especially since, since the, the, the top decks you see at tournaments are always, always different. different. People, People always, always say, this, this deck, deck does not work, it's not going to work, and then somebody's like, you know what, I'm going to build that specific deck. deck. Is that the case, case of the pandas? pandas? I'm going to build a panda deck and show you that it works. <laughs> I mean, and it worked I, fantastically. I went to our locals with Arcane of, of War, and I uh, I changed my Chimimi deck and, and took Arcane of War, and I went two games without losing, so yeah. that, was, two matches, so that <laughs> was pretty... <laughs> it it's just goes to show you. In it's... fact, one of our guys is playing Brunhild Knights, and he went yeah, and defeated the other week, and then it's like... You can just throw a different ruler in, and it changes so much about the decks, right? And and there's so many like uh, checks and balances where one deck beats another, and it loses to a different deck. And I just really like that kind of atmosphere. I, I, that's, that's something, something I actually enjoy a lot. A lot. And the, 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 the fact, fact that, that um, one, one of our one of our players, players in the community is extremely, extremely competitive, and he's like, like, you always want to win, you always want to win. And I'm looking at it from the opposite perspective, which is like, I'm actually enjoying playing the game. I don't care if I win or lose. I'm learning different mechanics. About how I mean, yeah, I feel like I, even if you always want to win, it there's so many different <laughs> ways you can go about it, right? So, yeah, even exactly. if you're like that spike or that butch kind of player, like, oh, I want to win, or I always I'm a Timmy, I want to do something cool, there's always like Timmy isn't different than Spike necessarily. Timmy can be both. He might want to win, but he wants to do it in this crazy, wacky way, right? Yeah, exactly. Maybe he wants to play Sandora and pull out these random three drops that aren't related at all. Like, <laughs> maybe he, he really likes the mystery box, but he likes one drops, so he's going to play like five one drops off the mystery box. Like, like there's so many different ways you can do things that uh, other yeah. games don't really lend themselves to as much, right? And, and Th that's, that's basically, basically the creativity, creativity is something I really like about it because uh, for me, like, like Master Feature and I completely, completely love building like, like random, janky, the jankiest decks possible that will never work. work. And somehow it always works work together. together. <laughs> In the, the end, end it somehow works. Work, and it's, it's like, like, well, that, that makes, makes no sense. sense. And then the, Some of the best decks I've ever built were just like, this is good, but I'd like to put this random jank in here and see how that works. They're like, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Trial and error, right? Trial, Trial and error yeah, it works fantastically. Um, okay, well, actually, you've given, of course, a little bit of background regarding other games you've played. Uh, 
What, uh, what, it's it's <laughs> well, you've kind of you've, you've kind of gone, gone you've kind of given this little background. background. Have, have you, you is there a game, a game in your past, past that you've kind of played, played, played the longest that's, that's kind of set you up for so well, or did just was it just the arc alone? Um, my sorry, keep going, keep going. No, in my case, I'll be honest, it was for me like Master Feature and Damon had been playing the game for about a year and a half. And, and I, was I was looking, looking at it going, going eh, 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 until, until I, don't I don't know where, where it was. I think it might have been on Instagram, Instagram where I saw the before, before NDR, NDR released. I saw a full art of Lucifer, Lucifer and I'm like, wow, wow the, the art, art, just the art alone. Okay, you, you know what? what? Wasn't the, the lightsaber with Arthur? No, no it, was, it was. It was no, no. no it, it was Lucifer. Lucifer the, the the flip side of Lucifer. I don't know what it was about that, but it just it drew me a hundred percent to the game, and it was just like, I love this art. It's 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 a perfect balance of. Anime, anime and, and just, just like a more serious tone to it as well exactly it's it's, it's, it's like, like a perfect, perfect balance of anime and, and realism is the best way i can describe it because it's, it's like, like a, a, that's, that's, that's the best way i can describe it for my mind but yeah if you uh, if you like those kind of art styles like a uh, grim cluster would have it was really nice for that like you had like uh seth the arbiter and like cinderella that are really like these really dark tones and like lad and all these like really dark sinister characters and you also had like light and fluffy characters like alice and all that kind of stuff right speaking so, yeah, yeah speaking, speaking of lightsabers, lightsabers um this is actually where i got my vladimir promo card was from you guys when you when you my first order from you guys, oh, you, you, okay. you guys yeah. threw in a bunch of, of extra cards and i'm like as soon as as soon as i saw vlad like the old vlad with, it looked like they had two lightsabers i'm like oh my god this is amazing <laughs> I need uh, to but to answer your question about the uh, the games I've played in the past, just before we go too off topic, um, it, it's pretty extensive. I actually play a lot of card games. Uh, like I said, my first one was Yu-Gi-Oh, but uh, I don't really play Yu-Gi-Oh very much. If I had to say my longest card game, it really depends what you're saying, because Yu-Gi-Oh, in terms of a competitive game, was probably the one I played the longest, even though I wasn't uh, really, really serious about it. Uh, if you were to ask me, like, just in general, I'd say Weish Wars, because I still play it, and I started playing it. Uh, around halfway when I was playing Yu-Gi-Oh. Okay. Um, but it's a very, very casual style of game. Uh, so if you had to say the longest that wasn't uh, Force of Will, um, I would probably say it was that. If you mean like competitive, uh, yeah. there isn't really one that I've played longer than Force of Will. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. No, no I... I yeah, I'm not gonna say. No, that I mean, those aren't the only ones I played. I, I play like Hearthstone. I play Elder Scrolls. If you talk about like digital, cartoons, yeah, digital, digital and Master everything Chronicles, else, Souls, White Shores, Yu Gi Oh, Force of Will. <laughs> I played Magic just to try it out. I didn't really like it that much. It like, was, I've, I've given everything a try. It's just yeah, you, you gotta try it once and then see what, what resonates, resonates with you. The, 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 the thing I really like about this, about Force of Will right now, is that you get a Magic player, and if it's like if it's a seasoned Magic player, like the other. Uh, the, other, the other day I was at the shop. I like, like I, I showed up early. There was nobody there. But there's at the same night there's a magic tournament going on. Uh, yeah. One of the guys for the magic tournament showed up early, and we were just sitting chatting. And I'm like, hey, do you want to try this game? Like, we got a couple decks, trial decks here. Do you want to try playing it with me? I'm like, I'm kind of bored. I don't know how to play magic, but I can probably teach you how to play this way easier than magic, or so I've been told. Within within five minutes, he was actually playing the game, and it was fantastic. Just going back and forth, and he was like, it made so much sense. And he was explaining from magic. Standpoint, standpoint, he was like, like this, this game, game seems so much, much easier, but, but there's, there's a lot, lot of complexities, complexities to it. it. And it was like, yeah, there's there's lots of small intricacies that you don't pick <clears> up on initially, but become pretty apparent very quickly. But what as a season, season and just, just as a player, player that just played, played only magic, magic, it was surprising how fast, how quickly he picked it up. And he was able to play it like very quickly and he enjoyed playing it, which was kind of nice to see. Like the the biggest thing that I took when I started playing for Civil Will versus Magic, because Magic has a really good baseline. Um, but I feel like they didn't flesh the baseline out the, as well as they could have. And there's a lot of other games like Hearthstone that kind of take it up a little bit where they yeah. try to refine things a bit more. But they often take very different changes. Force of Will is actually really, really similar to Magic in terms of the bare core essential game mechanics. But okay. things like the stone deck being separate, their creatures attacking separately, having the ability to attack rest of characters... Uh, all of these little things make a really big deal because things now are different, like which character you attack with first or uh, do I choose to attack and then leave my character vulnerable or do I attack and then leave myself vulnerable to a removal spell that says on attacking characters or do I attack, sack a guy for another ability or ram him into another character so I can ram with the second character. And these are things that don't really work in other games for various reasons, like you, you know, uh, yeah, there's yeah. no damage. In Magic, you attack with everyone. Uh, and they have to block or they just take it, that kind of stuff, right? So um, it, it opens a lot of combat differences that other games just don't have. 
And it opens a lot of mechanics and a lot of strategy, to be honest with you. That's yeah, and, and the other part of that is that uh, I don't think there's any other game where you can go back between battle as a sub-step of the main phase and come back in. So that opens a lot of things too, right? Like, if I'm attacking you and you block, you can be like, alright, now I play the swiftness character and I attack you for a game. You're like, oh shoot, I didn't expect that, right? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's <laughs> ridiculous. Um... Okay, so, so coming, coming from, from we'll, 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 we'll go, go with, with your, your seasoned season veteran, veteran because you've obviously played more than I have. <laughs> yeah, I th- I, like even in the U.S. group, I don't think there's a whole lot of people who have played since Grim Cluster. So. Um, we have, in, in, in our, our specific, specific play group, group um, we have two, two friends that have played, played almost since almost almost the beginning, beginning almost since Grim, Grim Cluster. Cluster but um, in your mind... mind uh, let me actually find the right question here. What advice do you have for... Okay. Uh, do, you do you have any, any words of wisdom, wisdom for new players, players for getting into the game? I think the biggest thing I would say, and this doesn't just go for Force of Will, but it applies a lot because there's so many uh, deck building freedoms you have, is to pick what you want your deck to do before you start looking through cards. Because I know a lot of people will have this huge pile of cards and they'll be like, I don't understand how to make these cards do what I want to do. And I'm like, well, you're going at it the wrong way just because Miss Kelk's a good card and Tigris is a cool ruler or all these kind of things. It's like, that's not that's not the way you decide how things work. You might really like Tigris. That's fine. But you want to come up with the idea of what your deck's supposed to do and then find cards to work for it, not just go through piles of cards and be like, ah, oh, these are good. These are good. These are good. Because uh, in other games, it's a little bit more forgiving because you have like, uh, special archetypes that you're sectioned into, like Vanguard and Yu-Gi-Oh! and games like that. But even though there are archetypes in Force of Will, it's definitely a lot more like open and varied. Like You want to really stick to what you think a deck should do, whether you're summoning a lot of guys or going really fast, like Swiftness and Burn, or maybe you want to have like lots of say no cards or cancel spells or discard or what have you. Like You just want to have a really good idea of what you're trying to do. So that way you'll one, know what you want to build in your deck, but two, you'll know what is and isn't working when you actually do have a deck together. And when you're playing the game, you'll know, hey, my deck wants to do this. Here's how I'm going to do it. If I'm playing a discard deck, I want to make sure I play the discard cards before I fill my board with creatures or vice versa. Okay. okay. So, so basically, basically have, have a strategy, strategy in mind before, before and then work around Yeah, but before you even put your first card in your deck, make sure you thought of what you're trying to do with your deck. And it sounds simple, but you'd be really surprised how easy it is to get overwhelmed with cards before you've even made that choice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, this actually, actually leads, leads to the, to the next, next question. question. Is, is there, there any mechanics, mechanics or things, things you would like, like in the game changed for possibly making it easier for, for new players? players? Or, or for, as, as a seasoned veteran, 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 for mechanics, mechanics that you would like changed for, for, for like, like a seasoned veteran, veteran in the game? Um, I don't think mechanically they really need to change a whole lot, but it would be very nice if they uh, focused less on archetypes. And that's going to be uh, kind of... Uh, What's there to look at where? Uh, it's going to cause controversial, controversial, okay. because uh, the thing they've done the most in this set that's caused those people to join in was they said, hey, here's 10 rulers. We're not doing any other rulers, and we're going to focus on these archetypes. These are things we're going to support throughout the sets, and people love that. That's like you're new, you started playing, you found it really easy to get into, I'm sure, because you had these couple different styles that you could jump into, but there's lots of variety within those styles, right? Exactly. exactly. It was very uh, limited. It was more focused. So I think I, I, it's, it's a very streamlined experience, and that's really great that even though they streamline your experience, you still have so many different options you can go toward, right? But a lot of those options are from Red Cluster, where there was this huge, like, just this smorgasbord of different options and nothing was super super streamlined it was all just very open right um so i feel like we've lost that a lot in the in the last cluster or two where things are very streamlined and that's not necessarily a bad thing but i wish they would have um, a little bit more uh openness design wise for yeah, yeah. how you want to build your deck because uh, archetypes aren't bad and they definitely do it the best i've seen in any kind of game like with pandas being a very specific thing, or Brunhild, or humans, or what have you. Uh, but I, I do want them to kind of keep that in mind when they go forward. Hey, not every deck needs to be a human deck if it's light or anything like that. There can be lots of different options. And I uh, basically just hope they keep that in mind uh, going forward, that archetypes aren't always the answer to everything. That's, That's kind, kind of something, something I've, I've noticed. noticed. With, with, with the, the new, new set, it's, it's very limited. limited. But, but as, as soon as, as you... you open yourself, yourself up, up and you start using some, some of the rare cards, cards it, it opens, opens up things, things a lot more whereas for me yeah, i can I only order so many cards from the rare cards, cards from what's available and then it's it's, it's I'm, I'm more or, or less, less limited so, so in my, my deck building, yeah, that's, that's kind of why my deck building kind of lacks it because i'm very limited to new cards whereas 
some of the players in the community have more access to the rare cards because they've been playing longer and they're able to kind of mix things up and come up with different strategies. Like if you look at cluster formats, and uh, this is something you'll see a lot in um, other countries, is that the decks are a lot more limited because they're stuck playing machines, or they're stuck playing Hanzo, or they're stuck playing like Brunhild, and it's it's very specific archetypes without a lot of outside stuff. Where even something like uh, it's a bad example because Tiger is out of the cluster, but <laughs> something like Pandas, where it's very straightforward, having access to Miskelk makes yep. the deck a lot different because now you have a one mana answer to aggro. And that means you can focus on filling your board with pandas or doing what have you. So even small things like a single card uh, can change an archetype vastly and kind of open your options a lot more, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, sorry, just kind of going through because that's, that's unfortunate we're not having all the questions in, in order. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, We're I, gonna I kind of got really into my answer, and I kind of forgot what the question was. <laughs> well, uh, no, regarding the mechanics, and you, you actually yeah, you stayed you on topic, topic perfectly than I do. Like, I'm the one that usually goes off topic here, but you, you stayed on perfectly. Uh, so just going back a little bit to the community, um, do you, do you, how do you see the community in Canada as compared to um, other places you've been? Like, because I'm sure you've been, you've definitely been to the U.S. Um, have you been to Japan in terms of uh, tournaments or like? Uh, I've been to Japan, but uh, it was only for Worlds, so I didn't see any local tournaments or anything. I do have a good idea of what it's like there, though, for local tournaments. Are you able, you able to give us a little bit of insight how it's kind of different? different. Like, like how, how, even, even if it's, it's just the U.S. US and Canada, Canada, how did the fur in terms uh, of Well, it's actually, like, there's a lot of differences. Uh, Japan's the biggest, biggest one for differences, uh, because they're the very definition of, like, four-person is a tournament, because they can have four to eight people, but that's basically what they expect for a tournament they don't expect to have like 20 people in a room or 10 or 15 or what have you there you show up you play and you have a good time and that's basically the tournament scene um, wow. and that's okay. pretty obvious when you look at how their gp tournaments are like 38 people that's a really big tournament in japan is basically 38 people right um and that's why they view it with more of like a let's have fun style versus uh yeah, this is a super competitive ultra event. Like, uh, there's the story of the one guy who was playing Lumia back in Legacy of the Lost Format, and he was just drinking alcohol right before the tournament. Like, just <laughs> drinking a thing of vodka. He's like, yeah, we're going to do this. And I think he actually topped in it because he was just having fun, but he played a good deck. He just, you know, it's not all entirely about winning, even though he obviously wanted to win, right? It was all about this experience about having fun, right? And I feel like Canada actually embodies that a lot, even not quite to the extreme that Japan has. But okay. um, I feel like a lot of the players in Canada are more about having that experience. They want to go to events to meet people, to have fun, to have some engaging games, to get cards to trade, uh, all those kind of things. They just want to build memories and experiences. Where, as I feel like the U.S. is a lot more focused on being competitive, winning prizes, uh, traveling to a bigger events, uh, qualifying for more tournaments. They still want to have fun, but there's a lot more emphasis on being competitive, right? And uh, you know what? Uh, I can agree, agree with that more for in terms of Canada. I mean, that's what drew me to the game is the fact that I could just have fun in the community. Yeah. Was, I understand it was a few friends that already had in the community, but they really embraced. They weren't like, if you don't want to be competitive, that's fine. Just come enjoy the game. Just come play. Come have fun. It's a good time. And that's, I feel like that's something that really needs to be made more accessible and in terms of me okay not more accessible it needs to be marketed out more it's like come join us yeah for a few i think games. the u.s player base kind of like has a lot of like oh no the tournaments are being canceled the game's dead now should we jump on urgent saga and all this other kind of stuff it's like well no just because they canceled a competitive event doesn't necessarily mean the game is dead in fact i think the game's more alive than i've seen it since probably alice cluster uh when a lot of people started leaving because of the the imbalance issues but like it's it's uh, a lot more organic than it was there because back when that game was at its height of popularity was right between Grimm and Alice, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and it was popular because it had this huge prizing structure where you could like win trade trips to Japan and stuff. A lot of it was that people jumping ship game, the game would be like, oh, well, this is a great game where it's very cheap and I can win lots of prizes and stuff. But yeah. Yeah. a lot of those players aren't players that stick around. As soon as like Dragon Ball or something would come out, they would jump over to that, right? Um, whereas the players that are joining now are very organic. They're like you. They're like, man, I really enjoy having fun. I like playing these decks. These are something that's in engaging to me. And if I win, that's fine too. And I like getting stuff from winning, but I also just like meeting people and playing, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Which is what really, really I think, think is, is a big selling point of the community. community. It, it hasn't has become, become, and I, I hope, hope it, like, like, I, I, I know, know it's, 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 it's like a bittersweet, bittersweet 
kind of kind bittersweet of here because I hope the game grows bigger, but at the same time, I hope it doesn't become solely about tournaments. I hope it's still yeah, the, the core. I think at this point that uh, it, if it, if the game lasts, it's the way it is now. Like the community will stay there, the sense of community, uh, the sense of how things go, the sense of how tournaments work, and that yeah, kind of yeah. stuff. I feel like we've already hit that spot, like the sweet spot where it either sinks or it floats, but it's the way it is, and that's the good way to do it. Mm, yeah. yeah, could, could not, not agree more. more. Like. I, I, that's, that's all I gotta say. I love the community, and I'm, I'm glad that you know, you know out where you the way you experience it as well is more or less the same as out here, which is vastly Whereas different in, uh, than the Europe, US. <laughs> it's, it's a lot different than you're in Europe too. Like they're very focused on um, even just like what games we play. And in Canada, I feel like uh, Wander and Epic Stories are actually getting a lot of steam for a lot of the new players, like a lot of the older card base. Yeah, surprisingly. Uh, whereas in Europe, uh, they're very very focused on the newest clusters and i'm not sure if that's because the distributor ends the events with lots of like cluster format where you can only play the newest sets um there are lots of uh stuff like that and there's also even if they do like wander it'll be genesis or something where you can only play one of each card like very yeah. off color highly competitive formats right so it's like a mix of uh the u.s and canada which is kind of weird oh uh, i think again very different Again, yeah, very, very different, different, but I think one of the reasons why they, why they kind of focus more on the newer the newer blocks is because they want to sell that product. So they're like, yeah, I think that's I, kind of distributor influence a lot, but it, it just goes to show you how how much something like that will affect it, right? Yeah. yeah. I, um, I've, I've also, also been. been um, I don't know if you have you actually joined the the U, uh, sorry the UK. Force the World Group. Um, uh, I didn't actually know they had one. I'm in the Italy group, but... Okay, so I'm in the... There's, okay, there's an <laughs> Italy group, there's a UK group, there's a uh, French group. Oh, wait, group. I, sorry. I think I'm in a Europe group, like a general group. There, there, there is, is a general, general Europe, Europe group, group, but there is a... The Italian uh, group, they always post in Italian, so I can't read it. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can never I reply back. back. I always have to use Google, Google Translate, Translate, but I can, I can actually read it. So that's the nice part for me. Anyways, for the UK group, there's... It's... What's called uh, for Manchester. Manchester. It was actually, actually pretty, pretty cool, cool to see like, like the, the, the amount of people because the, the week before when they were posting um, 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 what they were going to have, what price they're going to have, and whatnot, whatnot, it didn't seem like there was a lot, lot of traction about people answering, answering and being like, "Oh, I'm so excited for this tournament." tournament. But, but when the tournament actually happened, happened it was surprising how many people actually showed up and just yeah. I think UK is traditionally pretty small for Force of Love. It is pretty small, but they had quite a bit of turnout. It was surprising. I think they had like eight or ten players for. And you know what? If eight or ten players show up for a GP concert. Like, like UK is a pretty small country. country. I mean, that's yeah. fantastic. fantastic. Let's, Let's be honest. honest. I think that was how many they had back in like Alice Cluster days. So like that's a, t t for perspective for a US tournament. Our largest was like 200 people. So yeah. their largest was like 15. So <laughs> but it's a lot of perspective on like, hey, there's a big difference between our, our game in these countries. Right. I, I agree. But uh, looking at the US as well as uh, just compared to Canada, their population is just so much bigger. It's just... It, it's on a completely uh, different scale. <laughs> something I really noticed is is there's a lot like I mean it's funny because Canada is a huge country, but there's a lot more regional divide in the U.S. than there is in Canada. Like for really? example, I'm willing to drive with my friends eight hours out to Quebec and we'll play an event, right? But a lot of people in the U.S. just don't have that kind of freedom because of like tolls and how long it would take to drive between places and stuff because the events are just so far geographically, right? Well, that's well, like I couldn't drive to Vancouver. Obviously, that wouldn't be a thing. It's like a four day, five day trip. But <laughs> it's a lot like that for a lot of people in the States. Uh, that, actually that actually brings me to the next question, question, which is, is uh, it's, it's a little, little bit early, early to answer this question, question, but I know you were planning on doing um, kind, of, kind, of kind of like a summer GP for, for gamers later. Um, is there more any more details you want to share with people on that? Or uh, I know lots I want to share with you guys, <laughs> but it, it's there's still a lot of stuff being planned for it. So I, I can't okay. say too much about it, but uh, I'm thinking June or July ish, and it's going to be like a GP style event. So something a little bit more competitive than like a local is going to be like a regional event. Okay. Um, um, I'm I'm hoping to make it like uh, something that actually speaks Canada. Like it, it just bleeds that thing we were talking about, where it's a Canada competitive, uh, like fun competitive thing. Okay. So I really want to make it something people are going to remember. So I'm hoping that Taylor Prince, uh, you might know her from like all her artwork she draws in the U.S. group. Uh, she's actually from Kitchener, so she's pretty close to us. So I'm hoping that I can work with her on getting uh, an exclusive playmat commission for everyone who plays. Oh, that'd be. Uh, Wow, wow, cool. And but. there's also a lot of other stuff like that that I want to have done. Like the one thing I can confirm that we're getting is the official Energize coins. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Ones. So, and there's a lot of them because the way they print them is like in these blind packs. 
So if anyone went to Worlds, uh, I'm speaking to a very small group here, but if they went to Worlds, there's these sealed uh, silver packages, and inside there's one random ruler on a coin. Uh, that's what they do, but they have tons of different artworks, so there's like a really big pool you can pull from. Uh, so that is one thing we'll have for sale and available as an entry promo. Uh, there's going to be other things of similar vein to that, but right now, without spoiling too much, that's all I can really say. Oh, no, no, that's, that's fantastic. fantic. Like, <laughs> I, I know <laughs> when, when, you, when you were saying, saying you were thinking about having the tournament, tournament, but there was no definitive date. There was not even, uh, uh, we're, we're definitely, definitely having, having a tournament. tournament. So, so, I mean, I mean that, that, that's, that's fantastic, fantastic because, because um, um, I know a few friends and I are like planning on... On, on, on traveling out there for this so as long as ho we're hoping that we get enough like an advance time for it like kind of being like this is the date this is what's happening uh, as long as a month in advance we're like okay you know what we might be in calgary we might be like four thousand kilometers away but we're, we're definitely coming for it so it should be a lot of fun and, and that's what i that's what i want i mean i know it's not reasonable to say yeah i'm gonna travel from quebec six hours to come but at the end of the day that's what i want right like there is a threshold where people will travel and i want to try and get to that point without being like yeah we're giving six thousand dollars in cash because people will travel for that but uh i feel like at the end of the day only the first and second place really get a benefit out of that kind of pricing right you yeah, no, know exactly. But, but at, the, at, the, at the end of the day, it's, it's more of an experience. experience. You're, you're going yeah, there, and, and that's you're not going to only experience. Is, so the way I want to explain this to a lot of our viewers is you're going there. You're not only going to experience the tournaments. You're not only going to meet new people. You're not only going to have a lot of fun. You're not like, even if you lose, I'm going to tell you, you're still going to have fun. You're going to meet people. You're going to have whatever. But at the same time, you're able to explore the city, take an extra day and go explore the city. You're able to explore Canada. Go, go, you know, no, go, 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 go pet, pet some beavers. beavers. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure if you'll find many beavers in Barry, but you might find some like uh, coyotes or something. So. <laughs> no. But no, but I mean, in all no, honesty, if you go somewhere, you're not going to, you're going to like work it in. You're, you're going to pass through a lot of places if you're coming from Calgary. So. <laughs> that, that, that's just a we're, good we're actually planning like, it. If you're traveling, you're traveling. So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we're, we're actually, um, we're, we're, we're thinking thing is probably flying. It's going to be a lot cheaper for us, but... But, but if, if not, not like, like a road, road trip, a 24 hour road trip would definitely be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. so, so we'll, we'll just, we'll call it the Canadian cannonball run. Yeah, if you've never been to a GP, and I wouldn't uh, say that you'd be alone because most people haven't been to one in Canada because we normally only have two a year. Uh, but it's a really fun, fun environment. You think it's super competitive, but and it is. But there's lots of people who are just like, yeah, I drove five hours because I've never been to a big event. I want to have fun. I want to meet new people. I want to play these crazy, wacky decks. I want to get cool play mat and stuff that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Like just it's about the atmosphere, you know, it's and it's not something that I could say I ever had with like Yu-Gi-Oh when I went to regionals or anything like that. Right. So that, that's kind of what I really want to emphasize with this event is that that's the kind of feeling I want to have. And I'll have really cool prizing if you get to first, eighth place or what have you. It won't be like $6,000 cash, but I'm going to make sure it's something you're going to uh, – it's going to be worth a good chunk of money and you're going to be really happy that you want it. It's going to be like a nice trophy for you. But well, at, at the, the end, end of the day, day you're going to At the end of the day, you're going to have that yeah. uh, kick-ass play mat from Taylor, hopefully. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to try to like pick your, your, your brain too much. In that. I will just leave it at that and just say you're going to have a lot of fun. You're going to be out in Canada. There's like – it's just you're going you're gonna to have fun. That's all I'm going to say. But it's, I'm, I'm extremely excited. We have definitely a few, like, we, in, our, in our community over here, we're in Calgary, we're just, we're extremely excited about this event. And the fact that, you know, there hasn't been one in, uh, in Canada for a little bit of time here. So we're like, especially since I started playing the game, I'm so excited. It is just, just, we'll, we'll have to make it work in terms of, um, for me, unfortunately, but we'll, we'll figure it out. I mean, there are going to be actual GPs. I've confirmed that much. They just can't say when or what it'll be at and all this kind of stuff just because there's so much going on with the company right now. But there will be Canada GPs this year. Oh, uh, that's just all I can say, really. And I can't really say it'll be this season or next season or whatever. There just will be an event or two. OK, so that'd, that'd be fantastic. fantastic. Well, I mean, you know what? That's that's, that's really surprising news. And then. There you go, guys. An official Canadian GP. That'd be fantastic. Official. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Until it's announced, it's not official, as I'll say. But, but there, uh, there is going to be something So beyond what I'm planning. I mean, I mean let's, let's be honest. Be honest. Uh, 
in, in terms of, I understand official when the quotation marks, but it's uh, an event that you're, like, yeah, the event, it's going to be a sanctioned you, event. It just, you know, when you hear about it, that's when you start planning your plates, right? No, but uh, what I was trying to say is like an event like the one you're having, it's going to feel exactly the same. I'm sure there's people that really only care about the money, but those are the people that kind of come in and out of the game, as you've pointed out in the past. But it just, I think at the end of the day, the only thing you're missing from an event like mine is you're not getting into worlds. That's pretty much the only difference you'll really know. But you're getting the full experience. You're getting 99% of the full this experience. This is Canada world. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, well, that's exactly, exactly it. Just, just get excited next. about it. <laughs> basically, the last thing I said right before I uh, cut out was uh, it's going to be a Canadian GP, that, or basically Canadian worlds, you know? The next best thing in the world. Um, <laughs> and then there was, there was a lot of sentiment on my part when, when you cut out, uh, but... I, I don't recall what I was saying, but uh, we'll, we'll go. <laughs> <laughs> Small technical difficulties. Yeah. Um, in regards to, you know, in the past couple of months, there's been a lot of news from the company. And <laughs> what has the feedback kind of been in, the, in your local community? Have you seen numbers decline? Have you seen people commenting? Or has that been the general Canadian spirit of just being whatever? We'll just... Yeah, it, it's basically <laughs> been the exact same. We, we've had the same people, more or less. Like, we've had a lot of new people join in and out. But more or less, we've had the same 10 or so people since the end of Lapis Cluster. And those people have stuck through it, throughout everything. Um, it's only been getting better since then, mind you. But at the end of the day, uh, this doesn't really change anything in terms of how they view the game or anything like that. Which is fantastic. I mean... Yeah. Only the people, as you've mentioned, only the people that are extremely competitive and only... Go jump from game to game to only be competitive are the ones that are really going to be the best way I can say it is going to be the trolls in the <laughs> in the community. I, I mean, I, I won't lie, it's not super great what's happening because uh, they're right now, since with the new leadership, they're definitely in a cost cutting mode, and people are really complaining, like, oh, that's the end of the game. That's I'm like, no, it's not. It's pretty typical when you get new ownership that they're going to look at everything and say, hey, this is this, this needs to be cut. Why are we spending $800 on printers when we have 500 printers right here? Stuff like that. Like, you know, maybe there's not every invite needs to be paid, that kind of stuff. Uh, it's not a new company taking over. It's just the investors taking over leadership directly. Mm -hmm. uh, and as an investor, the first thing you look at when you take over control of the company is like, hey, where did all of our money go? And it's like, oh, there's all these random things happening. Let's tidy these up. So it's not... Like something that's amazing for the game, I'm not gonna lie in and sugarcoat things. It's it's a cost cutting thing, but at the same time, they're doing it because they want the game to keep going. They want the game to keep making sets. They want there to keep being events. They want the people buying product. And you don't go and plan a full year of product for a game that's gonna die, right? Like that's something that they did really well that I really like that the old company didn't do very well at all. They went and said, hey, here's all the products from now until February 2020, and that's a really good sign. Uh, but in the short term, things are pretty lame because you got uh, a couple events were canceled in terms of American events. You got uh, the paid invites and a couple of prizing things related to that were cut out of GPs. And uh, in terms of like local store, what you'll see there, uh, the play mats for buying three boxes are no longer a thing or six boxes, depending on what set it was. But uh, they're just doing another promo card now versus a uh, a buy a box or buy a, a mat. Or by three box promo. I don't even know what they actually called it, but the, but you know what? Uh, at the end of the day, they're they're showing that they're in it for the long term. And at the end of the, end of the day, as an investor, the only way you're going to be able to make more money is if the game actually succeeds. Yeah, Let's like Edgy was great at uh, creating a sense of community and making sure the game felt fun and all that kind of stuff. But uh, it really seemed like he didn't really have a great grasp on the financials, which is something the investors obviously care about a lot. Um, so at the end of the day, having solid financials means the game's going to be successful. And I'm fine with the changes in the short term because they mean the game's going to be successful in the long term. As long as they can keep a sense of um, of corporate culture, uh, that is what something Edgy had put in. Because at the end of the day, if it's something like Bushy Road or Konami, it's just not going to work because they're very like strict business. We're printing cards to make money kind of deal. And as much as that is what they're doing, I feel like they've built this really big foundation of we love the game. We want to see it keep going. And I feel like as long as they keep the corporate culture going that way, nothing else really matters as long as they make money. I could not agree more. I mean, I think that's going to be the key success of this game and moving forward is 
they have an established community. They have a dedicated community that are just in, are de- extremely dedicated to the game, regardless of what mm-hmm. happens. Uh, um, there's a few that are going to c- go in and come in and out, but the core is there as long as they built off that core and they can say, you know what? We can do both. We can make money and we can still keep the game competitive, fun, mm-hmm. and keep that core community aspect there. As long as they keep going off that, and as long as they recognize that, um, I mean, I understand it's very unfortunate that uh, like Jeff the liaison was kind of cut, but at the same time, I understand their point of view that they need to focus on making more, making more cost cuts in order to have a longer print period for the game. Let's, that's the best way I can describe it. But as long as they bring back the communication and they keep the communication increase the communication between the community and and the company, that'd be fantastic. I mean, that'd be... That's kind um, of what a lot I, like, of players are looking for. We don't necessarily for. need the same level of communication as Jeff was giving us. I'll, I won't lie. I love having someone tell me what's happening all the time. That's great. But, I mean, having a minimal amount of communication is pretty key. And they made the first step by announcing the promos uh, directly. I think they've made multiple steps because they've, they've, they've um, announced a full year of products they've announced the promos they've that, that's really good in terms of product lineups but it's not like a direct communication for the company I, that's more of like a sales pitch it's like hey you want to buy this new vacuum it'll be out in a year <laughs> it's not I really agree. you telling me about what you're doing as a company it's not you saying this is a great vacuum i love it i use it all the time it's saying hey i've got a vacuum buy it in a year yeah but at the end of the day people I'll are have not a new one a year after that no i agree it, it's good from a business perspective and i and i really appreciate that as a retailer because it's better uh, than it's nothing. not great finding out about a set literally three months before it. and it's like hey the pre-orders close next week and you're like ah uh, okay 10. yeah exactly that's something i really didn't like like the fact that you had to pre-order so quickly and it's like it's like i kept asking my shop for like what can i pre-order the next set like strangers of mm. hollow what can i pre-order it I was like, oh, yeah, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And then it's like, by the way, you, need, you guys need to pre-order tonight or it's going to be like, I'm like, I, 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 I've been asking you for months. I've been asking <laughs> you for months. <laughs> and that's why it's great that they announced this already and they keep his product images and, and stuff like that. So I can be, hey, this sets out uh, in this time. Uh, these are the promos, or I might not know the promos, but this is what you'll get if you get three boxes or what have you. Yeah. Here's what the price will be, and it releases on this date. And I know these things 100%. Uh, because the company has outlined this already. And if there's going to be a big delay, it's going to be a huge deal. It's not something that just drop on us at the end of the day. So I'm okay with that. Like these are really important changes that the company is making. It just kind of sucks that they're all being made at the same time from this huge shift in management, right? Yeah. It, it, at the end of the day, it is what it is. And actually, I'm going through my questions. You've kind of, we've gone off topic so much okay. with some of the questions that <laughs> we've actually covered all of them. So... <laughs> Well, it didn't specifically be like this, what is this and this and this, but we've actually covered a lot of the information, which is kind of, we've, well, I didn't even need to print off my script. We've kind of gone through everything. And it's been it's been a fantastic experience. I mean, I, I feel bad because I got a lot of stuff written down so I could go more in depth and I just kind of yeah, went like, you know hey, what? Go ahead. You know question. what? Go ahead. Just, I mean, I'm, I'm out of, on my, on my end, I'm out of it. But if you if there's something you want to put forward, by all means, go go for it. There's something we can discuss. Uh, let's well, turn this uh, to a little mini series. Going back <laughs> into like the just throwing things at the at the wall and seeing if they stick. There's a lot, like a lot of my decks that actually got me like top thing or like third place at like Montreal or anything. It's like these are the decks that I just sat there the week before, and I'm like, I think this is better. Like we could do something different. Like uh, a big example was um, I think it's two years now. When Prisia was legal and Return of the Dragon Emperor just came out and I sat down and everyone's going on and on about this Levitine combo where you play Levitine or two or three copies or whatever and you flip your Prisia and she has swiftness and you attack them and then you use your Godzart to stand again and you attack them again and you kill them and that's the only way you can play the deck. And I was like, well, I mean, yeah, killing them seems pretty good, but maybe there's something else we can do. And I was like, I really like Sasano. What if we played Spinning Myths from this set, and it puts Asano into play, and then it gives a stone, and then Prissia's ability will give this Sasano swiftness, and then Sasano will steal three things they have and attack them for 2,000 damage. <laughs> I was like, as a turn two play, that seems pretty good. And it turns out it was pretty good. In fact, I, I actually didn't know Ryan Miles personally then, but I sat against him at round four or five, and I did that on turn two, and he was like, 
yeah, that's uh, that's game. <laughs> and it was like, well, even if he flipped his Priscia, right, uh, he wouldn't have any regalia because I stole them all with Sasano. So he didn't have he didn't really have anything to hit back with. He could do like two thousand points of damage. Oh, that's um, insane! And, and it was something that actually like really preyed on the meta game a lot because everyone's answer was just slap four death sites in their deck and call it a day because now it doesn't have swiftness, right? But uh, if Izanagi just eats all your death sites, then uh, he just punches you, and you have one turn to deal with this 2,000, 2,000 level 6 character, uh, or you die, and that just <laughs> creates a lot of pressure, right? Yeah. Um, and then I also still had Prissy. Like, I could still flip and kill them if they didn't have a death site. Oh, jeez. Uh, but it's stuff like that that you don't know about unless you try and, like, push the envelope a bit or, like, try random things. Like, uh, another good example, and it was actually inspired by my Prissy deck, but it has nothing to do with it at all, uh, was... Um, at the ARG Nationals, uh, everyone was playing Sherry because of Sherry. And it was probably the most broken deck we'll ever get, other than maybe Fox. But Sherry is, is pretty much uh, very consistent in the fact that it does what it does. Um, and I was just thinking, well, I don't like playing Sherry. I'm not going to play Sherry. And I was like, there's got to be another deck that I can play that I'm going to enjoy playing. And I was like, well, I've been having a lot of fun with Lumia ever since Lumia Command, but that deck doesn't exist anymore. And I thought, well, what if... I played it like it was Prissia. And then I'm just like, but there's not really a way for me to do it. And then I said, oh, there's this card. It's the Verdant City. And it says if I play something that has swiftness, I'm like, well, if my entire deck has swiftness, I can probably do something with this. So I ended up going in with this deck with like, uh, had like four of the Prissia from Battle, or uh, shoot, what's it, what's it? Uh, Echoes of the New World, where she enters the field, she destroys a guy with attack less than or equal to her, or when she attacks, she does that. So... You play the Prissia with Swiftness, yeah. it kills it all. You attack, it kills it all. You blink at the end of the turn, it kills it all again. So you could kill four Resonators in one turn and still have this huge 12-12 Prissia on the board that's going to kill more things next turn. Oh, uh, or you could have like a Jupiter that you flash in, and the Jupiter would uh, like bounce a guy to the hand or rest a guy or draw you a card uh, like or cancel a spell, and then you'd be able to attack with the Jupiter. And then since all these cards are Swiftness, they'll be tapped, and at the end of the turn, they're the Lumia will flash them, and they'll come back in, and they'll get their ability again. Uh, and if it's Jupiter, he can actually stand himself, so he can block next turn. And like, there's just all these crazy combos, and it's things that people were just like, "Yeah, uh, this deck isn't uh, Sherazad, so I'm not going to play it." Um, that's that's okay. This is and, and, like these, this wasn't like a deck before. I just like threw all these things yeah. together, and I'm like, "These are probably going to work." Uh, Lumia is good. Uh, the city it, it, is good. I like Swift. It works. Like. Yeah, it, it's like you don't know unless you try, right? That's basically it. Like uh, in, in our group, we just kind of th throw together random stuff that you don't think is going to work. I mean, sometimes you get utter working. garbage. Like I've had at least six times we go through a deck together. I'm like, this doesn't do anything at all like I thought it would. And I'm never going to play this again. But that's where the playtesting comes in. And that's where it's yeah. fun to go playtest at lo your locals. That's where it's like you can come up with the best idea in your mind possible until you go and you try it against different decks. It's never going to it's never going to play out, right? And it's ultimately, like, sometimes your deck is just bad in general. And, and you got to admit that. It does you happen. Can't be like, Man, it does happen. Maybe this 30-color deck is going to work. It's like, no, you should probably stick to, like, you know, four or three. But you never know. It might work. There's lots of crazy stuff in Wonder, <laughs> for example, right? Uh, not to give away too many spoilers, I've actually been working on, a like, a. It, it's, I know it's been done, and I've just kind of put my own spin on it, on a Darkness Light Bronhild. And the first remission of the, of the deck, I sat down and played with my friend. And the first remission of it is like, this is okay, good. Like, we both have like 13,000 health, but it's like, are you okay? Maybe? It kind of works. And then uh, went to my local play group, played against a bunch of different decks. And I was like, hey, this deck is garbage. Come back home. I'm like, hey, <laughs> it's garbage. We got to go back to the drawing board. P take out a come like, hey. The thing is, as you keep playing it, you realize what doesn't work. Like you had the ideal, as you said at the beginning of the when uh, when you were recommending to new players, have a strategy in mind and build your deck off that strategy. So I had my strategy, and I'm like, okay, this card doesn't work. This card doesn't work. This card doesn't work. Let's throw in more blades of faith. Let's throw in more, more, more whatever, and then it's come back to it of it, and then try again. It's like, okay, it's doing better. It's still not 100. percent Let's go back to the drawing boards, and that's the. I mean. At the end of the day, it is a strategy game. You need to go yeah. back and forth and try different things. And that's the f really, that's where the fun part comes in. And because whenever you're going to the, to the local play group, like to your local store, you're able to bounce ideas. 
not just get in your own head. You're able to ask, well, here's my deck. Do you have any suggestions? Right. And that's kind of the fun part for me. Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, I can't even think I've played green for like the last three plus years. Like I just really love green. It's my favorite color. And it's not just cause it's been broken. All the people say that all the time, uh, but I, I still play green now, even though it isn't super broken. And like, I can't tell you the amount of times I've rebuilt my deck to be, it'll be like a Jimmy deck or yeah. Hanzo deck, or it might have like really huge control cards. or will be like super aggro. Like I've got tons of different ways. I've rebuilt this thing 20 times. And at one point I had, uh, the spinning bullet ball, and I had like the giant gorilla and everything. And I was like, "Oh, I'm gonna punch them with the gorilla, and I'm gonna use it with swiftness because I'm gonna put it in with the uh, the the Von Boko, the raccoon yeah. guy, and then I'm gonna hit them for two thousand, and then I'm gonna use the bullet ball to finish them for another two thousand. I'll do four thousand in one turn, bam. And it's like, did that work? It's like, no. But I tried it at least six different times before I said, "Hey, maybe this doesn't work, and I should try something else." But you know, I, like, I, it's, I, it's moving all these pieces around. You're like, oh well, <laughs> this deck sucks, but I really like the bullet ball. It's pretty cool. Like. We, Stuff like that. Uh, when that when the Strangers of New Valhalla first came out, that was the most obvious tactic that, like, in our mind, like, when oh, Master it's Fiji bad, and... it's awful, but it's hilarious. <laughs> I love it's doing. hilarious. So when Master Fiji and I were opening the packs and we were kind of looking through the cards, as we're we're like live live stream opening these packs. We're looking through and it's like this seems like the most obvious pack, but in reality, when we go to test it, like, it's, it's the same experience as you, it does not work. Oh, like There's it's, different it's ideas content. that we have for trying to make it, it work. It's great it's like... to get Harambe on the field, just punch them in the face with him. But at the end of the day, it's like a six mana combo that involves three cards in your hand. You're like, but, well, there's like Lucifer and there's Bruno. Yeah. Like, I'm probably not sticking him on the field for more than two seconds. But, but it's hilarious. It's hilarious. And that Bumbaku Gorilla is what actually drew me to green. <laughs> And actually, it's green has actually become I when, like Lucifer is what drew me to the to the game, and I really like playing darkness, and I still like enjoy playing darkness decks. But that bomb Baku gorilla is what kind of like you know there's a lot of green support this this cluster. Why don't I want to just build a Hanzo deck? And I started building a Hanzo deck. Um, I tried doing the, uh, that combo, didn't really work that great. Threw it out. Tried throwing in some more. I tried throwing in some different like green cards. Didn't work for me. And then at the end of the day, I'm like, you know what? I like playing Loki. I really wanted to try playing machines. Let's throw green and machines together and see whatever happens. And it actually turned out to be okay. And then I've just been going to my lo locals and just refining the deck further and further to, to the point where it's like, okay, this is actually a decent deck. It's not 100%. I won't be able to 100% win against the Karak every single time, but I'll at least put up a fight and it'll yeah. go back and forth, right? That's like, where the I fun mean, comes uh, in. One of our guys at the locals was playing machines and those machines and it was doing well. And it's like, well, what if... What if I wasn't playing like Arthur because he kind of sucks? Maybe what if I played Brunhild? And it's yeah. just like, uh, okay, sure. And it's like, all right, what do you do? It's like, well, I got, Guinevere is a human, and I got the rune to bring a human back, so that's pretty good. It's like a, yeah, it's like using uh, maintenance, and it's like, well, what if I put a Joan Dark in there? It's like, well, I don't see how that works. It's like, well, you got all these mana filtering things, so maybe you can play Joan Dark, and she's a human too, and you can bring her back. And it's like, well. Now I you all of a sudden as a Joan Dark punching her in the face and it's like well these aren't uh, these aren't things you really see and then they kind of work you know like it's, uh, you don't really find these crazy combos just by playing everything exactly the way it's obvious right and that's kind of the one of the things like where I don't know you've been to more tournaments than me but it seems like they're everybody that brings a, a deck to the, to uh, to a tournament just kind of be, looks at the top decks in previous tournaments that have made the top list and tries to build a deck around that. Uh, I think that's the American way of doing it. Uh, Which is unfortunate. I, I that it seems like, like Google. They, they just Google everything. That, and I don't want to be well, like disrespectful towards our American like friends, but like, <laughs> come on, come up with a creative concept that you like and that you enjoy playing. Don't just copy what everybody else is doing. And that's what a lot of decks seem to be like. They're just copying the same ideas. I understand well, certain ideas are better than others, but that doesn't mean that's the only way that you're going to be able to beat everything i mean and, and i won't rule out like i'm not that guy who says net decking sucks don't net deck you have to make everything yourself i'm like no obviously it's unrealistic no. you have to have some sort of an idea of what you're doing before you can say well what if i threw bury ball in there or something stupid like that yeah. right you gotta you gotta have some sort of idea of what is a good card and what isn't before you can just subjectively say man maybe harambe isn't worth throwing in my deck and maybe i should play a better deck 
Like, there is definitely a place to say, maybe I should know what other people are playing before I throw a deck together. But, but that's... you shouldn't just take everything at face value because that's how you lose tournaments. Like, yep. there were so many people who didn't know that Charizard was a great ruler, and I was just like, oh, no, I definitely need to know that Charizard is a great ruler and everyone's going to be playing here, right? It's like um, Ayu. Ayu is still a fantastic yeah, ruler. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, what's what's so the other one, the Dust Girl? Me destroyed by IU or Dust Girl because they forget they exist and like, oh, well, I guess I lose. We like, have, it's not a thing. We have a player in our player group who hasn't lost a game with either IU or Dust Girl in, I want to say, eight months or so. And it's impossible. <laughs> like, if, if he ever gets annoyed with, like, how our decks are doing, he's like, hey, let me pull out my good decks. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's ridiculous because the decks he's built are just, he's thought about every single situation and it's, it's, those are the decks you you want to go up against and be like, okay, if I can yeah. have a chance against those decks, then if I go to a tournament, then I'll be okay. And like uh, blue and, and green and even black, like there's lots of in this format decks that have tools that work against all the other decks, but only the limited degrees or something, and and that's a lot of like the in game. Uh, strategy versus the deck building mm -hmm. strategy you're like okay well he could have one of these 20 cards but realistically he's probably not going to have this or have this and there's just so much like mental uh, clockwork going on in your head you're just like oh I got to think about what if he has the board clear instead of having the master in his extra deck or, or and there like, are actually, all these different small things there actually is a huge mental aspect to the game as well when you're facing an opponent and i found this out as well is you can actually toy with them and be like i could have this in my hand or i could have this or oh, i could yeah. have this or i could have this it's your choice There's what you want to do i just passed because i have a really bad hand like he's got five green up does he have jupiter i'm like i don't know do i have <laughs> jupiter you know i love jupiter i put him in every deck and they're like uh yeah i don't know you're playing Jamimi. you probably don't have a jupiter and i'm like no i definitely have the jupiter Okay. Um, my hand was also really bad. That actually kind of... <laughs> um, your, your comment kind of reminded me of something that I kind of wish this 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 cluster had. I wish it had a little bit more support for dual color stones. Um, it's possible to do right now. It's possible, like... Um, th my Sorry, main deck right now is green for, for dual color stones. Oh. Um, like, I know it's possible because I'm running, like, a blue-green deck right now, but it's not... Mm -hmm. They're not... There's it's not they're not dual color stones so you're kind of stuck you're kind of forced whatever you a stone you draw you're kind of forced to go around die like ch constantly change your game plan based around that whereas i feel like in the past where they've had multiple dual color stones it's it's made it a little bit easier to have a little bit more consistency in your decks if you're running multiple colors um so something i can say with someone who's played uh my entire career with dual stones up yeah. until this point uh, I absolutely hate dual stones, and not really? for the reason you think. Yeah. So the reason you would think that dual stones are great is because you can play all these different crazy combos together. You can do all these different deck building options that you wouldn't have available to you otherwise. But what actually ends up happening is you cram as many of the best cards in your deck as possible. Um, and I think Alice Cluster was really, really bad for this because you'd see the deck. Every deck would run Black Moonbeam. Every deck would try and run Cheshire Cat or Tam of the Familiar or Zeke's or any of these really good cards for this color. And it didn't really matter what color you're playing. You would play these cards because they're good cards. If you didn't play them, you had a really darn good reason why. Because you need the space for something. But there was always this mentality where this character, this player always has Zeke. This player always has Seal of Wind and Light. This player always has Black Moonbeam. And okay. it doesn't matter what deck you are. You always have those cards. Um, and it was a lot less like that in Rhea Cluster. But you still had like five color gills and all these other things because because you have perfect mana all the time and i won't lie i miss dual stones because there's lots of like red blue decks or something i want to play and i'm like man i don't have green red so i can't play the verdant city which means i can't get access to ramp which means i can't get the swiftness which means i can't do all these other things that i want to do but i'd rather have me making an actual hard choice when i'm adding multiple colors than just say yeah why not it's free okay. i may as well just play three colors right yeah and that was something we saw a lot with uh uh, last one with like Sherazad and stuff. Sherazad would always play three colors because it was super, super easy, and it was basically just conceding to your opponent to not play a third color, right? Yeah, the main ones that I see right now um, are the, the do uh, what's called the null stones and the stones yeah. of hope. Those are the main ones I think that are still legal. I don't know if there's something else. I think there's um, a... and some of them have bigger drawbacks than others. And I'm honestly really okay with those kind of dual stones because they have pretty significant downsides. The biggest one being Stone of Hope. You need to flip your ruler. 
Uh, exactly. Uh, or else it's a basic, basically. A, it's a vanilla that doesn't have any abilities and it doesn't even count as a basic stone. Um, Null stone is actually probably the weakest, in my opinion. You just take damage. Um, and it, it doesn't matter unless you're playing against an aggressive deck. Yeah, you take damage, but it does work. Um, we had a player in our locals that just built a brand new Fushi deck, and he had yeah. those stones. And, he and unless he's in a, a match went... against Kyrick or something, he's probably not going to care that he's paying 200 each time he plays a Yeah, exactly. Kyrick. He just completely went the opposite way and just said, you know what, I'm not even going to focus on Fushi's ability. I'm not even going to focus on the fact that I I need. Uh, I'm going to take damage. I'm just going to focus on the fact that I want to be aggressive, and this is what I want to do. And because mm -hmm. of that... Like, his game plan was not, I want to run dual stones. It was not, I want to run the specific ruler. His game plan was, I want to be extremely aggressive, and I want to control the field, and I want to just keep swinging. And it works. Mm -hmm. Just as and that's why I think uh, Null Stone is a really lazy way to do the dual stone mechanic. That's not like, stuff like Stone of Hope is a legitimately good way to balance yeah. the... Or, or uh, ruin story. It's like I can make black, but only for stories, and everything else is just a basic green. Yeah. Uh, a barrier, or like the uh, Stone of Hope. But like you said, uh, I could be Kyrick and I have four Null Stone, and the only time it's ever going to hurt me is if I'm playing against another Kyrick and he doesn't play it. Yeah. Uh, the other part I really like is that the older rulers are still viable. They're still. Yeah. They're st they're still playable. You can still play them without any new cards, which is really surprising. Um. One of our like Damon and one of our friends has plays Kirk and he hasn't actually updated his deck since he built it. There's no new cards that he's actually put. He's still waiting and being like, hey, maybe the third cluster, the fourth will have to some something decent, and it's still a decent deck. That's the surprising part. Um, yeah, I think Kirk is the best example of like an archetype that uh, is very polarizing because you really want to stick to his cards and you yeah. don't want to change them because they they actually impact your deck's consistency as a whole. Uh, and you might really like a new card, but it, it might actually like not be a, a bad alert, or it might not generate strength counters. And like he's very much that thing I was talking about earlier. Like I don't like how they segment you to an archetype, and Kyrick is probably the biggest example of that. He's very, very specific and straightforward the way he does his plays. And then not yeah, to you're... say it's a, a, not a hard deck to play. Kyrick is like a mile a minute thinking, but at the same time, it's it's very linear in terms of deck construction. Yeah, and then um, I think I've only faced against a Shayla once or twice, but it's, uh, I seem to be the same way with Shayla. Um, I'm, if I'm thinking the right one, she's the mermaid ruler, correct? Yeah, uh, she's yeah. Um, she's not as straightforward because she's got more available to her, but she's definitely got a lot of cards like the Thunderstorm, the Thunder Cave. There's definitely cards you always ought to include in her deck, uh, but she's not necessarily as big of a problem in terms of deck quality as yeah. Kyrick is, in my opinion. Uh, and then I'm I'm hoping we'll see. Well, moving forward, we'll see what what the third and fourth cluster. But so far, I'm actually pretty hopeful because, I mean, the first cluster I can really not do dual color decks so consistently. With the second cluster, it seems like it's a little lot more consistent for me to be able to say, okay, I'm gonna play six um, six blue stones and four green stones, and I can actually have a consistent, rather consistent deck every single time. I'm saying I'm gonna be 100% consistent, but it is relatively consistent to where I can play. It competitively and i'm hoping that the third cluster will kind of carry that on and have more more of that like i understand that there's not i don't have that dual stone there yet but it's still um i'm really excited about it <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm... Uh, the third set is always my jam like it always has like these amazing power cards that kind of curve out the whole cluster in terms of like what you want to do with the deck and the third <sighs> set's where i always get my my incredible ideas that are always amazing and, and they kind of blow my mind like that uh, actually it was like turn of the dragon emperor it was uh, like i said with the prissy deck that was a third set like yeah third sets are always the, the that's juice. what i've been told the second decks like the second clusters always are in terms of power and, uh, level are pretty jeff bad. was saying that this time they there was a lot of stuff that was like he barely passed when he was producing because his last set that he worked on yeah and he was like man there's some strong stuff in this and i'm like yes that's exactly what i want to hear Good, good. I'm going to definitely order like six boxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like uh, the, the one that did spoil. There's only one card spoiled as far as I know. It's the uh, the spread of the treasure tree. Yeah. And it's like the old Valhalla card, but it's yellow. You tap it and banish it as well as discarding a card and it creates three yellow. Oh, wow. Which is really crazy because if you're discarding a card, you can set up Brunhild plays for flipping and, and you're ramping yourself to be able to play five mana cards on turn two. But at the same time, it leads itself open to removal. Like, that's a really crazy, powerful card. That's a really good, like, uh, example of how good cards from set three generally are historically. 
Wow. Like wow. every color will probably have a card of that caliber, like this kind of game defining card. Which is something to look, especially for new players to look forward to. Is, yeah, it, is Nick, I think uh, powerful cards are exciting. Yeah, well, they're exciting. It gets you, it, it kind of creates the, I don't know. It gives you the sense that when Bambaku, like for example, when Bambaku, like when I saw Bambaku and, uh, and the girl, and I'm like, oh my God, I can, this is amazing stuff. Like, you know what? It gets you excited about the game. You try the idea and then you realize it does work or it doesn't. And then that's mm -hmm. the, the, the nice part about powerful cards or where, where I perceive as powerful cards. <laughs> well, uh, that's the thing that like, uh, that's a, that's a very balanced card, but imagine if you said like, what if the, uh, the ball didn't have to cost any man at all or yeah. something like that. Like that's the kind of things these powerful cards established. Like uh, I could think of like 20 different decks I could build with just that treasure tree as the, like yeah. the center fold. Like powerful cards let you do these crazy, crazy plays because you have something solid to fall back on. And, and that's why I'm so excited for these kind of decks. Like it, there's so many it's things you can do. The only decks. thing I can say is that it's unfortunate that they pushed it back. I understand why they pushed it back because it was this, they were saying that it was uh, tying with a different with GP dates, and people mm -hmm. wanted to be both the locals and whatever. So they actually listened to their community to push it back. But at the same time, I'm like very excited and I'm ready to go it's, for it. But it's pretty spicy as well. I, like I, I've only know one card and I'm excited. So <laughs> I'm actually excited um, for more machines and seeing what they can do with machines. Like right gross, now, Chris. Pardon? <laughs> they're really fun to play. It's just, I don't know. It could be because they're, I find them extremely easy and that the amount of maneuvers you can make with machines is interesting right now for me. Yeah, Lancelot um, is pretty crazy. Pardon? Lancelot is pretty crazy. It, Lancelot is extremely crazy, especially with the Jizzo statues. Like, I don't understand the, why they printed Lancelot to say remove counters from anything. Which is <laughs> only resonates. You can't take them from Arthur. Arthur's still useless. Okay, f fair enough. Fair enough. It does say resonators, but it's still uh, to I me. Mean, it's I'm still, just... I'm still trying to find out a use for the fact that if you play, you know, the addition is a uh, a machine. Yes. All right. So if you read the Magic Stone, it says you can put a uh, one one counter on any machine that has entered the field. So you can put one one counters on the addition. I haven't found any reason to do that. <laughs> I want to find a way that you can take advantage of that in some capacity. That would be interesting, actually. It's the what... only machine card that says it doesn't care what it is. You can put it on there. Whereas all the other ones say it has to come from a resonator or come from a J resonator yeah. or something like that. So That would be interesting to do. But uh, we'll see. We'll see what the future holds. And I'm actually, <laughs> you know, I'm... I'm I mean, we're all excited. I mean, for those of us that have been in the game, even if you're new to the game and you've you've seen the current sets, you still get excited. The only thing I, I kind of wish that they would reprint the the decks, the starter decks. Yeah, that's it's hard to get new people in when you don't have a or spot at least, for them to jump in, or at least throw into the new boxes. Be like, we're gonna print rulers, throw them in. Like, I, I won't lie, I sold them my last Lost Tomes starter deck the other day, and I'm like, okay, I'll just order them. I'm like, oh, so now they're also out of Lost Tomes, and they're out of the new Valhalla. So yeah. how do I get a new player to play, right? Like, I, I might have been one of the I people just, that bought two of those. Do I just <laughs> put all these basic rulers in a deck and be like, here you go, it's, it's Arcane of War Turbo. You know what? It works. For new players to start off, to have something to start off, yes, it's not exciting because they're... If they would have made the basic, like th those those uh, small tournament uh, rulers, like the Arcana Wars, if they would have made them actually the art look really good, I feel they could get away with it. But their I'm, art I'm style. I'm always is... gonna rep Arcana of War at any tournament. <laughs> Best <But> ruler. If... <laughs> but the only thing is, if they would have had like a much better, like one side is good, but the other side is kind of like meh. So if they had better arts, I feel like they'd be able to get away with it, but. As it is right now, um, they really need to reprint. I feel like if they had actual effects on their flip side, that would that would probably. Put them, like, <laughs> if you noticed, it, the divinity is 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 kind of sucks, and you can't play chant or you can't play regular runes, only chant runes. But at the end of the day, I think the biggest defining feature is if you flip rune hill, you bring a guy back. If you flip Hanzo, you flip a rune down. If yep. you flip uh, uh, Chimimi, everything is plus four, plus four. If you flip one of the draft rulers, they have a body and they literally do nothing on the other side. And you're like, oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> well, I think uh, the I fact that they were made for this, draft, like, like 20, yeah, 20 card decks. Yeah, but, you know, it would, they could have really toned down flip effects or something, but they just have nothing, so. Oh, well, we'll see, we'll see. It's a pretty big improvement from the last draft earlier, but it's, it's still not anything to write home about. 
it's definitely not, but it's it's still fun and it's still like you like you'll enjoy playing it and just having fun with that. So Arcana Four. <laughs> All right, I think it's uh, getting a little bit late for everybody, and uh, I want to once again I want to thank Dylan for joining us from Gamers Layer, and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and we'll see you in the next one. Don't forget to subscribe. I better see you guys all at the event, or I'll be very upset. Actually, that's something I want to thank you for running money, guys. I cannot say this enough. Go to the event. <laughs> That's all do I'm gonna it. say. Just it's basically just world, it. just smaller. Come on. You know what? You know what? It's Canada. It is worlds. World. Yeah, it is worlds. We'll Canada go with world. Canadian worlds. Or yeah. Can <laughs> yeah, Canadian worlds. I'm talking about all you Americans watching. Get your Celine Dion on. Get your Tim Hortons coffee. Get your Beaver skin rug. We're coming. Come to Canada. <laughs> That's the way you should advertise it and just be like, drink your maple syrup out of the container. I don't care. You're coming to this event. <laughs> Hey, you need the energy to be able to go through tournament, right? So the maple syrup is going to add a lot. Plus, you know what? Once you get a deal with Quebec drivers, you have to be prepared for anything. So, <laughs> well, that's something I'm looking forward to. But uh, it's been Don't a pleasure having you on our channel, Dylan. And yeah. can I say thank you so much for joining us? Thanks for having me.